Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us? Today, we're going to celebrate the forgiveness that we have in the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses us from all sin. There's power. There's power in the blood of Jesus to forgive. You're going to know this hymn, so I invite you to let's sing this out together as we start worship this morning. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. pretty good good morning do it again good morning everybody hey I'm glad that you've gathered to worship Jesus this morning Um, would you grab a seat for me real quick hey if you are new to us today um, do me a favor come find me or Matt Newman or one of the other leaders in the church before you leave today we'd love the opportunity to shake your hand and say hello and if you're watching online this morning welcome we're glad you're here too please come join us next week in person God is 
at work and moving in Anchor Church, and we do not want you to miss it. Amen? Amen. Good stuff. So this morning, um, we are um, finishing up our series that we've been calling God Speaks, and I want to encourage you. Uh, I'll say this at the beginning of the sermon, at the, in the teaching time, uh, give God yes before you even get to the Word. I don't know if you've thought about that, but sometimes I think we show up in worship or we open the Bible and we think, well, if I, if I get something good or if he has something to say or, you know, but the truth is if we've learned anything in this sermon series, God's always speaking. And our heart posture is, yes, yes, Lord, whatever you say, the answer is yes. And so I want to encourage you. Um, it's the end of the series. There's some application for the body of Christ today that's very particular. I want to encourage you here at the very beginning just to orient your heart around yes. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm here. Your word is spoken. Yes. And so that's, that's going to be the posture of our hearts this morning. I want to let you know something. We'll kind of end uh, part of the application this morning with this. Next Sunday night, we're going to gather here for a prayer and praise night. In the text, it talks about a solemn assembly, and uh, we're seeing these quarterly prayer and praise nights as an opportunity to consider all the things the Lord's been saying, and for us to align our hearts and our lives together in prayer um, together. And so I want to encourage you, if you um, can, and even if you don't think you can right now, make plans to join us next Sunday night um, as we uh, seek the Lord's face together in prayer as a faith family. Hey, we're going to start the service off in a pretty exciting way. You good, you good with that? We're going to baptize somebody. Anybody pumped for that? Yeah. So um, Judah Robinson's getting baptized today, and his dad is going to do the honor this morning. So guys, come on up. I think, oh, I, I did turn it on. So uh, thank you all for showing up this morning. Um, <laughs> Judah came to me a couple weeks ago, and uh, after you know hearing about baptism and seeing baptism occur multiple times at the church in the past couple of months, and said, so what's this baptism thing about, right? So we got to have a very good conversation about it, and uh, Judah asked that I would be the one to baptize him. So I'm very excited to be here with my son. I think as many of you guys can probably relate, those of you that have children who have professed faith and have been baptized, it's a wonderful joy um, to be part of this with him. So, Judah, what are we up here today for? Um, I've embraced um, Christ Jesus as in by faith and I'm showing it through baptism. <laughs> Amen. Hopefully you guys can hear that. All right, you can take those off. They said they got it nice and warm for you, so hopefully that's the case. Woo! <laughs> Feel good? Let me see your hand there. So, Judah, based on that profession of faith, I baptize you. I'm going to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not only my son, but my brother. Okay? Buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Hey, um, celebrate with him loud. Let's hoop and holler over that. Hey, as the worship team comes, would you pray with me? Let's give thanks to what, for what God has done. Father, thank you so much for new life in Christ Jesus. God, thank you that your Holy Spirit is at work, and uh, you're going before us in our community. You're at work in this place this morning. God, I thank you that... Um, some time ago that your Holy Spirit, through the faithfulness of godly parents, um, instilled the truths of the gospel of Jesus in Judah. God, we thank you that Judah has come to um, faith in Jesus Christ, that his um, heart is a heart of repentance, and that his desire in his life is to uh, follow after Christ with, with all of his heart, with all of his life, with, with all of his soul. God, we pray that um, the body of Christ here at Anchor would be faithful to invest in every person that passes through these waters, that we would disciple them, and um, God, we would join with parents and see them raised up to be more and more like Christ Jesus and to live the mission of God um, with the church. Uh, Father, this morning, 
As we continue in our service, we pray that you be honored in everything that's preached, everything that we sing, everything we do. You be honored with every person's response to the word of God that's sitting in this room. God, today, you have our yes. Mm -hmm. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? What love could remember? What love could remember no wrongs we have done? All nations, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Since they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait? What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. They are many, His mercy is more. Sing it out, church. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. He's stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood beneath the dead we could never afford. Since they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Lord, we, uh, we can sing a strong song, but it doesn't compare to the strength of your love and it doesn't compare to the strength of your forgiveness and your mercy. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the song of praise you've given to us. Lord, we have a reason to sing the mercy of Jesus over us, the forgiveness in his blood, the freedom that we have from the debt and the weight of our sin. God, thank you for the reminder through baptism that we become your sons and your daughters through faith in Jesus. And then we're given a new name and a new life and a new hope and a new future and a new eternity. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the time that we're going to spend in your word. Lord, thank you for what you've already done in us today, Lord, and the strength that you've poured into our souls through your truth. Lord, may we take up your word today. May we handle it rightly and faithfully. Lord, we pray you'd be honored. Lead Matt as he, as he leads us in your word. We pray all this in the strong and the saving and the powerful and the forgiving name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Today we have the honor. Ricky Harper is going to come and share the text that we'll be looking at today from Nehemiah. All right. Today we'll be reading from Nehemiah 9, verses 1 through 6. So now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord, their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenaniah. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord, their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> so when I go back through the text, I'm going to just say, and those guys, you know, and uh, what he said, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. That was amazing. Um, he actually told me, Ricky told me before he did this, he said, I went and like listened to some other people read this particular text to make sure. And he said, I didn't even agree with how they said it. So I just said it the way I wanted to. I said, awesome. Good job. So I want to invite you to open with me to Nehemiah. Uh, we just read from the first few verses of chapter 9. We're going to spend a little time in chapter 8 and uh, spend most of our time in that first part of chapter 9. But really, there, is, there are things that we're going to be referencing and truths that will spring really from chapters 8, 9, and 10 in the book of Nehemiah this morning. This morning, we're concluding our God Speaks series and, um, you know, seven weeks uh, we spent and we... Um, we're now to kind of some of the primary application of the whole series. Um, we're finally here. Um, there's certainly application that kind of happens as we go along. Uh, but when you um, preach a series the, like the one we've just preached, when you get to the very end, the application starts to feel weighty. Um, it begins to feel like, um, okay, this is what we're supposed to do. This is the way we're supposed to walk. And so this morning, I said this in uh, kind of the, the uh, introduction this morning, in the welcome, uh, give God your yes here at the very beginning this morning. Um, that ought to be the posture of our hearts and our minds and our lives every time we come to the Word of God. God, um, the answer is yes. No matter what you say, um, the answer is yes. Can I tell you, church, God does really powerful things through churches that God trusts will move in response to His Word. We've learned that in the series We've learned that God moves through his words. And the people of God who are willing to move in response to the word are the people God uses. So we open this series up seven weeks ago, learning that our God's a God who speaks, whose words create motion, motion that unfolds his will and his plans for his glory. So pause here for a second. God, from the beginning of creation until, until now, has been creating and moving and executing his will by the words of his mouth. That's power. 
I don't know about you guys, but I struggle to get the kids to load the dishwasher with the words of my mouth, much less cast stars into the skies and redeem the world, right? So a couple of my kids are like, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so God's word, his voice, his words, they're incredibly powerful and consequential and world-changing. Next, we learned how God speaks. We learned that he speaks through creation, that he um, reveals his glory through creation. He shows his mighty works through creation, his divine nature to everyone everywhere. But he does not, through creation, reveal the particulars of his plan of salvation. He doesn't do that. We discover that he has a special plan really for one part of creation, and that's you and me, humanity. Humanity. We learn that humans are made in the image of God so that we can relate to him, we can hear his voice, and we can demonstrate and declare the, the particulars of the plan of God's salvation to the world. We're God's plan. There's not a second plan. It's us, the church. We're the only creature that can choose to reject God's words and can choose to receive them and declare them. We're the only ones that can carry God's saving grace. Then we learn that God spoke clearly through the sending of his son, Jesus. The word made flesh. The gospel of John tells us that Christ is the word. God's revelation of himself through Christ was and is a special revelation. It's not limited to general truths, but instead the life of Christ opens the way for the redemption of sinful man and for the restoration of ultimately all things. God came down in flesh to make a way and um, to show us the way of salvation. And the truth is, what we do in response to the person and work of Jesus Christ for, is everything. It's everything. What we do with Jesus, if we reject faith in Jesus, the doors close for us. In knowing God and spending eternity with God, if we embrace Christ by faith, the door is open for us to know him personally and to be repurposed and to speak for him in the world. We've also learned that God has given us his written word. We talked about the significance of the written word to help us know Christ, to help us understand how to live a life, this life as his followers. The word of God, the Bible, shows us the way every single day. It encourages us, it corrects us, it transforms us. It's, primary, it, it's the primary place we go to hear from God as Christians. It's the word of God, the written word. Christians, Christian friend, we must test everything we hear in the world in the word of God. And if there are things that we hear in the world that we cannot find in the world, we should, in, in the word, we should keep our mouths shut about it because God has saved us to represent a new kingdom. Christians must test every thought and idea through the truths of Scripture, and if they don't match up, they are not our words because we speak God's word. Then we learn that God uses painful circumstances and difficulty to open our hearts and our minds and our lives to his voice each day, to draw us near, to show us his love. He is speaking, but a lot of times we're just not listening, and so the Lord even purposes the fallen world around us, the circumstances and sin around us and the pain around us to draw us in, to help us experience the true joy of God and the satisfaction of knowing God um, personally, the satisfaction of knowing his voice. And then finally, last Sunday, we talked about the role of the Holy Spirit, and we discovered that the Holy Spirit resides in God's redeemed people in part to enable us to recognize and understand and respond to his voice in his word, and to help us speak, to empower us to speak the way, truth, and life of Jesus Christ in a broken world. So this has been, this is the series. This is where we've been. So now what? We've seen Christ. We've seen the word. We've seen the spirit. We've seen creation. We've learned a lot about the Lord, that he moves through his voice, through the words of his mouth. Church family, the, the truth that rises above all of this is we are nothing apart from the voice of God. Very literally, we would not even be created without the voice of the Lord. We would not be saved without the voice of the Lord, and we would have no hope for the next step in life without the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is everything for us. So 
to open us up this morning, I want to encourage you and challenge you based on the last six weeks, reorient your life around the revelation of God. Now, we, re- we orient our lives around all sorts of things. But hear me, if, we are, if you're a Christian in the room today, we must reorient our lives around the voice of the Lord. Our waking goal every day should be to hear the voice of the Lord and respond. To hear the voice of the Lord and respond. To do the work of laying down the world and turning our hearts to the voice of God in creation, in in Christ, in the written word of God. Allow the circumstance of your lives, Anchor Church, to lead you to turn and seek the voice of God. Recognize his providential hand even in your difficulties. Learn to listen and to walk by the Spirit. Give your time and attention to the Word of God each day. God is speaking. He's speaking to us. He's speaking. He's speaking to you right now. There's not a moment since you were born that He was not whispering in your heart. He's always speaking. Are we listening? Are we listening? If so, when you hear Him, Respond. Respond. So my prayer is that our church will grow to hear and see him a little bit more each and every day and that we will learn to faithfully and boldly and humbly respond to the voice of the Lord. So that brings us to a question. Something I think we need to grapple with just a little bit. When the Holy Spirit empowers us to hear the voice of the Lord especially through the Word of God, what do we do? What do we do? When God speaks and we hear, what do we do first? That, that's the question. I, I think that initially, because we always, you've even heard me say, like the rhythm of the Christian life is revelation and response, revelation and response, or revelation and obedience. I think we often go straight to obedience and the truth is, ultimately, you'd, you'd be right if, the answer was, if you said the answer is obedience. But there's a first answer to this question and an ultimate answer to this question. There's a first answer and an ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is obedience. But the first answer to this question, the first answer today, we need the first answer because the first answer helps us to obey. And that answer is We pray. We pray. That's it. We pray. We breathe in the word of the Lord, and we breathe out prayer. We breathe in the voice of the Lord, and we breathe out prayer. And we breathe in the word of the Lord, and we breathe out prayer, and he leads us and guides us and empowers us. The right Christian response to hearing God is to enter conversation with him through prayer. Prayer must become the reflex of our hearts and our lives when we hear God speak or see him at work. Let me say that again. Prayer must become the reflex, the reflex of our lives when we hear God speak. Can you imagine the distance between our obedience and the revelation of God becoming shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter because we are going straight to God in prayer and he is whispering the particulars of obedience in that moment to our hearts. The power that God would unleash through his church when motion became more and more immediate as God spoke to us and through us. So write this down. It's our big idea for this morning. When we hear God's voice, pray. When we hear God's voice, pray. Pray. When we hear God's voice, pray. I want to show you what happened back in Nehemiah and Ezra's day. I want to give you a little bit of of the context, and then I want to show you how the people of God responded to the voice or the word of God. You know, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book at one point, single volume. They were written by the same author, and they tell the story of God's people leaving Babylon and returning to the city of God in Jerusalem after 70 years of being in captivity. So these 
books, they focus on three guys. You might have thought two. Most of the time we just hear of Ezra and Nehemiah, but there was a guy named Zerubbabel that led a group. I told you I wasn't going to say all these crazy names, but there he is. Zerubbabel, who led a group of back to begin to rebuild the temple. And then Ezra led another group back to the city to continue to rebuild the temple, but also to teach the Torah and to rebuild the community of, of God. And then Nehemiah led a group back to rebuild the wall of the city. And you remember back in our um, family gathering, we talked about some of the, the ways that Nehemiah led and how they, um, they did work with one hand and they had their hand on the sword. You remember that a few weeks ago? Somewhere along the way in this rebuilding process, the people of God discovered a copy of God's word, the law. There's debate about what they actually found. I think they found the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The people wanted to reestablish the nation under the authority of the Lord, and they wanted God to move powerfully on their behalf, and they wanted to represent the Lord in the world around them. Does, does that sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? They wanted God to move powerfully on their behalf. They wanted to rest on the authority of the Lord. They wanted... Um, the Lord to use them in the world around them and represent himself through them in the world around them. So after Nehemiah and the people completed the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, they got busy seeking right relationship with God. If you go all the way back to the very beginning of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's heart was torn over the conditions of the wall of the people, of the community, and his desire was to reestablish the people under the authority of God. Anchor family, I'm not sure... I'm not sure what your thoughts are about Anchor Church. Have you thought about your church in a while? Maybe considered the church, evaluated the church, considered the condition of the church? I think we would all agree. There are some really wonderful things about Anchor, aren't there? Like you, you start recounting the stories of things that God has done in and through this place. There's some beauty and some goodness, and God has been so faithful. Amazing story in the life of this church, but can, can I tell you something that, that is at foot? Some you are, of you know this already, and some may not recognize this, but um, God's been speaking serious and strong conviction into some people's hearts here over the last few months. speaking into the hearts of men and women uh, around the church, but the ones I have a view on, I'm gathering with every Wednesday night in a prayer meeting. And can I tell you something? As we gather to pray together on Wednesday evenings over the last few months, um, the Lord's been revealing some, some things. And this is, these aren't things that I guided or anybody else in the room guided. These are things that the Lord said to people's hearts, and they laid them on the table and said, here's something I'm thinking. Here's something the Holy Spirit is saying. Here's something I'm struggling with. And it's led to some repentance and some confession of sin in our prayer meeting. It's been powerful over the last 30 days in particular as we've gathered together to pray. I've said this a couple of times, but as prayer goes, the church goes. Over the last couple of months, the Lord has been re revealing sin and blind spots and patterns that aren't honoring to the Lord. These are things that others have said. Things like apathy concerning the word. Apathy concerning the community of faith and the ways that we love one another. Not responding to the word in prayer and obedience. Instead, just consuming coming to consume. The Lord's revealed self-righteousness and pride. He's been showing us that we're not pursuing a relationship with people who are different than us in our church. Precious and kind member of the body even shared one week that she just feels like everyone just walks right by her. All sorts of things are being shared and confessed and wrestled through. Um, Jeff who leads our prayer uh, team, uh, he even asked, we, we were working through some of these things um, one week, and he even asked like, the group, like, what do you guys think co corporate repentance ought to look like? Whew. That's a different kind of question. It's not one you get every day in the life of the church. Can I tell you, let's see all of th these things. Some of this is super, a big surprise for, for many. 
But let's see these things as, as evidence that God's at work in our hearts. God is at work here. I believe the pandemic and the transition, um, remember, God uses difficulty. <laughs> it's been a difficult few years in the life of the church. I think we can see that as negative because there's seats empty or whatever. Um, but recognize that God uses these difficult seasons to prepare our hearts and tune our hearts in the church to hear from the Lord in a fresh way. God does not waste difficulty. God does not waste difficulty. I believe that God's speaking to us. I think he's speaking to us in these days. And as he does, I think we need to figure out what it looks like to respond to the voice of the Lord. And I won't pretend to know all the places that God is going to take us in the future. We can cast vision and dream big dreams and recognize that Scripture teaches that he can do more than we can ask for or imagine. But we really have no idea where he's taking us. But we do know how we must initially respond when he speaks. We may not know all of the answers to what obedience looks like in the coming days and months and years, but we know what it looks like to initially respond from this particular text. We must pray. Nehemiah 8 through 10 shows us what the people of God did when they returned to Jerusalem. I, I think there are a few things that we can learn from them that we can put into practice. So Let's start by taking a peek at chapter 8. So actually, I'm going to do a little bit of reading today. First, the people revered the word. They revered the word. Write that down. It's truth number one. They revered the word. People experiencing revival always revere the word together. Write that down. People experiencing revival always revere the word together. Take a look with me. This is verses 1 through 8. It says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded to Israel. This is the one they had just found. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. On the first day of the seventh month, and he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early in the morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the, this purpose. And beside him stood a whole bunch of guys on the left. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for it was above all the people, and he opened it. All the, and when he opened it, all of the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, and lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, a whole bunch of guys, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read the book, read from the book of the law clearly, and they gave the sense um, so that the people understood the reading of the word. I love this, this part of scripture. All the people, they gathered on the first day of the seventh month, they built a platform from which the word would be read and explained, Ezra starting reading it out loud before all the people, and the first day they read and explained it from sun up until the middle of the day, probably like six or eight hours. Now, that's a long sermon, right? That's a long sermon. They missed lunch. Notice the moment the word, though, was opened for the first time. This is a big moment in the text. Verse 5 says that when the word was opened before all the people, for the first time in years, they stood up. And verse 6 says that after Ezra gave thanks for it, he blessed it, then the people started shouting, Amen! Amen! And they lifted their hands up, and they bowed their heads down, 
and even fell on the floor with their faces to the ground. Now, side note, if you're feeling it up in here, if the word was resounding in your heart in this place at any point, some standing up, some amen, amen, some lifting of the hands, some bowing down, and even some falling on your face before the Lord, it is acceptable. It's acceptable. As I wouldn't even say acceptable. It's encouraged. If the Lord is speaking to you, respond. If the Lord is moving, show reverence, show conviction, show celebration of the word, show the emotion of it like you would at the game, because this is a bigger deal than that. We live in a world and in a culture, especially our fair-skinned culture in the United States, where church is kind of like this and we don't do a lot of moving. That's not everyone's culture in church, by the way. Somewhere along the line, we decided that it was rev a, a, an issue of reverence. And the truth of the matter is, when people get in the Word of God, the people of God get in the Word of God in Scripture, there's response. And you can tell, not just because they go on, mm-hmm, but because their body's moving and their mouths are moving and they're saying amen and they're lifting their hands and they're bowing their heads and they're falling on the ground. God, we need your Word! These people were so excited to hear the Word read. You know, it had been 70 years that they'd been in captivity, and then some people came back, and it had been a few more years, and some people came back, and it had been a few more years. I mean, we're talking 75 or so years. There's been a, whole, a void concerning the Word of God. We've got it every day. These people were ready. They were desperate for God to speak and move. It was obvious in the way they responded to the opening of God's Word. We don't respond because we're used to receiving it, and Here's the hard facts. We're used to receiving it and just sort of pushing it aside. And our hearts have become hard to it. It's become less special because it's so ordinary. And God's calling us to reverence the word, to love it, to be desperate for the truth of God's word. Next, write this down. It's truth number two. People experiencing revival celebrate understanding together. They celebrate understanding together. Now, sometimes somebody will get up and they'll wax eloquently, and that's, that's wonderful. And then you have simple people like me who just want to kind of tell it like it is. You know? so, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. God can use all kinds of things. But in this particular text, they celebrate the understanding of the word. Did you, do you realize that there were hundreds and hundreds of years where the people of God only heard the word of God in a language that they did not understand? I don't understand uh, the reasoning on all of that. It wasn't even the original languages of Scripture. I mean, I can maybe understand that. But here the people were in tears at the reading and explaining of the Word. They were deeply convicted. Their hearts were, bur were uh, burned with joy and a sense of urgency. After hours and hours and hours of hearing and giving reverence to the Word, Nehemiah basically instructs them to stop mourning. Let me show you. Verse 9 says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra... The priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people, the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn and weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law, which is completely understandable. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, and send the portions to, some portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites Claimed all the people, calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, don't be grieved. And the people went on their way to eat and to drink and sent portions um, to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were being declared to them. They'd understood. It wasn't just that they were read, it's that the people received it and they understood it. I love this. Um, there's a need for us to pursue an understanding of God's word. And as leaders, there's a need for us to do everything we can do to help you understand the word of God. Notice that everyone in the celebration of understanding got the good stuff. Do you see that in the text? No one was left out of celebrating the word. One of the very first and immediate response was um, everyone was provided for. <laughs> and that's just, 
it wasn't even something that was really like focused on. It just kind of blew by, but the whole of the people celebrated. Um, but do you think that it was Sunday afternoon nap? I'm pretty sure it wasn't like a big meal. The text says a glass of sweet wine. Everybody's had um, six hours of the word. Now it's time to go take a nap. I don't really think that's um, that sort of mindless rest from a long day of worship was what was happening in this particular text. I think they went home and they sat in the truths of God's word together with family and friends as they ate and they took in food and wine and rest. All the while letting the word settle into their hearts. Nehemiah said, this day is holy. Don't weep. Instead, rejoice in understanding. In other words, like we're going to go out and eat and we're going to re- go out rejoicing in understanding. This is the celebration we're having. Spend time eating and drinking and considering together what's next, what the response ought to be in, re- uh, in response to the reading of the word and explaining of the word of God. Uh, in the fall... At Anchor, we're going to begin to set a little bit of a different course for discipleship here. And without getting into any details, because the Lord is still leading and guiding us through this journey, um, it's, we're going to center our, our discipleship on understanding the Word and putting it into, into play in our lives. Like gathering together to eat, to spend time together, to fellowship together, to rest in the truth that's been preached, and to wrestle together and discuss together how is it that we live this Word together. Between now and then, church, I would encourage you, every Sunday, this is, this is fodder for Sunday afternoon lunch. Grab a couple of friends from church and get together over a meal and talk about the things that God is saying. Confess the things that God is saying. Uh, talk about the, the ways that God is whispering in your heart and the things that God is revealing in you and in us. Gather with brothers and sisters. Eat, rest, talk about what God is saying to us as a church. There's a need for us to go from this place each week to rest, eat, drink, celebrate together what God is saying. Response to the word is not supposed to only be individual. That's that's a Western mindset. I don't know if you realize that, but individualism is a Western concept. It's not a biblical concept. It's not biblical. Instead, we should reason and consider together in smaller groups of people what God is saying and how we should put the word into action. Small groups' purpose ought to be to help one another put the word into action. And doing this over a great meal, bonus, right? We got together with elders and their wives and some other, a couple of others in our, in our home uh, regularly lately, and we've shared food together and enjoyed fellowship together, and we've been talking about the things God's saying and the things he's doing in us. It's beautiful. God is binding the elders and our families together in ways that... Um, We've been asking the Lord to bind us together. There's confession in that room. God's doing a powerful work there. Um, This is the way we ought to live. Next, write this down. People experiencing revival look for ways to obey together. So their their attention was, how do I put this into play? How do I put this into play? And they got a little, I think they got a little bit ahead of themselves, but Nehemiah 8, 13 through 18 says this. On the second day, the heads of father's houses Um, of all the people with priests and Levites came together to Ezra and the scribe in order to study the word of the law. And they found it written in the law of the Lord, um, had commanded Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths or tents during a feast in the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all the towns in, in Jerusalem. Going out into the hills, they gathered up all the supplies and they basically moved into the city and they sat down in tents. And the assembly, um, they returned, that had returned from captivity. They made booths. They lived in the booths. And from um, the days of um, Jeshua, uh, Jeshua of the son of Nun to, to the day the people of Israel, um, in, in the day of this text, this had not happened. And um, they began to do it, and there was great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, they continued to read the book of the law. See a theme here? And they kept feast for seven days. They ate and they drank and they read the word of God and they enjoyed fellowship together. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule that they had found in the law. You notice verse 13. It says that on the second day, so six hours, seven, maybe eight hours of reading the Bible, the very next day, heads of the different family groups the national leaders and the spiritual leaders gathered together after an evening of eating, 
conversation, consideration, and celebration. They got together to study and to consider what should be done. Over the course, I think, of some days, they were wrestling with Scripture, and they found that the seventh month was supposed to be the month. Remember, at the very beginning of this particular chapter, it says the first day of the seventh month. They found that the seventh month was supposed to be the festival of booths. Now, this is a festival meant to remind the people of the time they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. These people just came out of 70 years of being separated from the place that God's people are supposed to live. And they're led to this text about, 40, about this festival that celebrates 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They knew they needed repentance like the people who'd wandered in the wilderness. So since it was the seventh month, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the whole gang, they got to work gathering, gathering branches and building tents all over the city, inside the wall. And it, I imagine it took a few days, but then they initiated the festival, they ate together, they enjoyed one another, they considered the faithfulness of the Lord together, and catch it, for seven straight days, they listened to the word of God being read. Now, they're being a little crazy now. We had a half a day, and then they just kept reading and studying it, and now they get together and they live in tents for seven days to listen to the word of the Lord being read while they eat. And verse 18 says that they continue to read the word of God day by day. Basically, they set aside a whole week to live in tents together, to read the word, to consider the word together. They heard from God, and they wanted more, so, um, and they, wanted more, so they, they stopped what they were doing, the rhythms of life, and they gave themselves the expo- exploration of the word of God. The word was not an add-on to their day. The word was their day. Notice, up to now, everything has been about the word of God. in in chapter 8. Reading it, celebrating, considering it, receiving it, considering how we obey it, read it some more. It's clear from chapter 8 that they wanted to hear from God and they wanted to do what he said. Um, Church, can we just pause here and let me ask this question. Is that what we want? Do we, do you, want to hear from the Lord and Do what he says. Do we want to hear from God and do what he says? Yes. Yes. Now, there's some here that you're in your heart, you've heard some yeses around, but you're weighing the implications, you're wrestling with the implications. What might God say? What is this going to disrupt? My bank account, my career, my family, my habits, my whatever, fill in the blank, all the things that we love? Maybe. Write this down. People experiencing revival, they take in the word, And they respond to the word in prayer together. I want to show you that in the text. The text was read a little while ago. Ricky read it. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. I'll just read the first few verses. It says, now, on the 24th day of this month, so it started on the first day. (laughs) They've done a whole lot of reading, a whole lot of celebrating, a whole lot of eating and, and hanging out and considering the word and trying to obey and sorting through it. But the main thing is the word is landing on them constantly. On the 24th day of the month, the people of Israel were assembled. (laughs) Notice the posture change in the text. took them 24 days. They were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law, and they keep going, of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of the day, they made confession and they worshiped the Lord, their God. Woo! 
Notice the last line in chapter 8. It says that they gathered for a solemn assembly on the eighth day at the end of the festival. I personally think that this was probably the 24th day of the month. But whether or not it was the 24th day of the month or not, this 24th day followed this solemn assembly that um, was had. Um, Either way, the people of God spent seven days in tents listening to the word being read. Along the way, they heard God say some specific things to them. And hear me, I'm not talking the specifics of what was read. Somewhere along the line, something, the text moved from their eyes and their ears and their heads to their hearts. Somewhere. 18 inches between the head and the heart. It might as well be a million miles for some people. Somewhere along the line, though, as the word of God was being declared and read and they were sitting and they were celebrating and they were thinking and they were valuing the word, Somewhere along the line, the word of God began to touch their hearts and God began to whisper into their hearts. How do we know that? It's obvious because they began to fast and pray. They began to fast and pray. That is what happens when people hear God and they receive it in their hearts. That's what happens when it moves past our ears past our minds, and lands in our hearts. We begin to fast and pray. We become a very unique people very quickly. In their case, they put on potato sacks and put dirt on their heads. A sign, an external sign, that God was on the move in their hearts so what happens in their culture, in their time, when God spoke to their hearts. They begin to fast, pray, they put on sackcloth and ashes. It's the same thing that happened. You know it, that, that it's made it to their hearts because it's the same thing that happened when devastation happened or pain happened or struggle happened. When people were deeply mourning over something, they put on sackcloth and ashes. The word had been read. The law had been read. The stories of God's deliverance had been read. They'd seen the sins of the people again and again and again through the stories of this uh, first five books of the Bible. They were cut to the heart. They put on sackcloth and ashes, and they begin to pray. When the word moves from the ears to the mind and into the heart, people begin to cry out to the Lord in prayer. That's what they do. It's what Christians do. This uh, keeping, it, keeping it clean and kind of in the box sort of uh, experience that we typically have in church, that's gone when we start hearing from the word and it, and it lands in our hearts. Life becomes unleashed and we become all about whatever the Lord wants. So they assembled, they fasted, they put on sackcloth, they put dirt on their heads. Verse 2 says that they separated themselves from foreigners, outsiders, and began to confess their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Now, there's some sermons in in that one little line. They drew together and they began to do the serious work of repentance. Catch this. They didn't only deal with their own sin, their individual sins. Remember, that's a Western concept. We... Have individual sins. Individual sins are a problem. But Scripture talks about sins of a community, of a people. They don't only deal with their own sins, their individual sins. They confess the sins of the past that they themselves did not commit. Do you see that? They did this because they recognized that the root of God's judgment of the entire people needed to be dealt with too. No one ever said, and this may step on a couple of toes, and I I haven't said anything about race in this sermon, so hear me. You may feel like I'm stepping on your toes. I'm not, I don't even mean that. But catch this. No one ever said in this text, that was not me, or That was not the sins of my parents or my grandparents or my generation. That was them. That's not my responsibility. No one ever said that in the text. No one. Nobody said it because that's arrogant and self-righteous. And it does not recognize the impact of generational sins on the church. 
and on God's plans and on the fact that he, on the people that he wants to bless and use. Remember what they just read. They just read Genesis, Exodus, the law. They read stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, it was a dumpster fire sometimes. They read the stories of slavery of the people in Egypt. They read of their deliverance. They read about the parting of the Red Sea. They read about bread from heaven, all really wonderful and positive things. But they also read about Moses disobeying God by striking the rock. They read about the giving of the Ten Commandments. But they also read about the people creating and worshiping a golden calf. They took it all in. And there's people in the room as they're reading these texts that were there before they went into captivity. Older men and older women who have shared the stories of why they were in Babylon. These people knew why they had been conquered. The reason, um, the reasons had been passed down while they were in Babylon. They knew the hearts of the people had been hard and catch this, that they'd refused to listen to the voice of the Lord. They had refused to listen to the voice of the Lord. And after a whole lot of time of refusing to listen to the voice of the Lord, the people were overrun. Devastation, death. And now, after all this time in the Word, after 70 years of exile, bearing the consequences of sin, they had a bigger picture of, of God and why he had allowed the people to be con conquered. And if the truth is, if we examine our past in light of who God is and what he has done, I think um, we'd never say, that's not my sin. Instead, we'd fast and pray and confess and repent. Have you ever considered why the church in the West is in such steep decline? Now, it's really easy to blame it on the changing culture. It, it's really easy. But can I tell you what that feels like, I think? When I was in New Orleans and Katrina happened, well-meaning Christian people came down on mission trips and they would say, God judged this, this sinful city. Now, if you live there, that didn't feel very, very fair. Just because these people don't hide their sins as well as you do doesn't mean that it gives you the right to come down to the city and tell us that God sent a storm to destroy lost people. The truth of the matter is the church was dying in New Orleans and God wanted to wake up the church. And he did. Fifty churches have been planted in the last ten years in New Orleans. Just Baptist churches. There's an openness to the gospel there that has not been there in hundreds of years. And it was storms and difficulty and tragedy that opened those doors. So it's easy for us to blame the decline in the church on a changing culture. Or, But the alternative is, the thing I think that we have to recognize is that God's people have lost their way. We lost our way a long time ago in the West. We allowed and supported atro atrocious sins in our country. People who proclaimed the gospel of Jesus in one side of their mouth defended their enslavement of others. We as the church have aligned ourselves with ideologies and agendas that are apart from the gospel work Instead of sticking close to the gospel and the work of the kingdom, we joined in this political effort to elect the right people so that they would save us all. <laughs> That's crazy talk when you think about it that way. We've embraced a deluded version of Christianity that allowed room for apathy and preference. Consider how people find a church, or at least before the pandemic, how they went to find a church. Now it's, they go on the internet and they find a church. But before the pandemic, they went to 12 different places, and whatever one kind of met the felt need, that's where they went to church. We've turned inward 
and failed to pour out our lives to accomplish the mission of Jesus? Scripture has become an optional part of our day. Prayer, fasting has become a foreign concept in the life of the church. Foreign. It's something no one does, or almost no one. Church family, I'm not dogging you out. This is an all-of-us situation. This falls on every single one of us who has heard the word and has not run to the Lord in prayer. When we hear the word and the gospel, uh, when we hear the, hear, hear the word and God speak to our hearts, the reflex of our heart must become prayer. We must enter that conversation with the Lord because he has some things he wants us to do. Verse 3 says, once again, that they stood for six hours listening to the word, and they spent another six hours confessing sin and worshiping God. This was not a one-time thing. This had become the new, the new way forward for them, hearing the word, examining life, examining history, examining the heart, confessing sin, worshiping God. This was the, the rhythm of their lives moving forward, and it, and it has to become the way of the church. We have to ask ourselves in the church, do we really want to be used of the Lord? Do we really want him to pour out his power here? This must become the way of Anchor Church. If we want to see God move in us and through us, we must begin to hear the voice of God, examine our hearts, our lives, our actions, even our past, and we must fast and pray, confessing our sins and the sins of our fathers to one another and to the Lord. Hear the voice of the Lord, pray. Hear the voice of the Lord, pray. Hear the voice of the Lord, pray. Pray. Nehemiah 9, 6, all the way through the end of chapter 10 is a corporate prayer of God's people. It's the corporate prayer of God's people. They prayed prayers of adoration, recognizing who God is. You can read it later. Prayers of adoration, recognizing who God is and what he has done. They prayed prayers of confession, full of confession. They're looking at the sins of their fathers and they're saying, God, that's where our people made a mistake. God, we don't want to make that mistake anymore. Show us in our hearts what needs to be dealt with today to keep us from walking in that way. They pray prayers of thanksgiving, expressing gratitude to God for his patience, for his love, for his mercy, that his, his patience has a long arm and praise God that it has. Praise God that he has. They pray prayers of supplication, asking God to grant them grace, the people of God grace. Then at the end, they made very particular commitments to God that were in line with the law of the Lord. This is a big move. What's in this text is a big move. It's not a small move. It's a cut to the heart. Change the way I wake up tomorrow. Embrace a different way of living. Move. It's Christianity. And God's calling us to it. Next Sunday night, we're going to gather for prayer. We're thinking of these prayer and praise nights as sort of like a solemn assembly where we've been in the Word, and we've been in the Word, and we've been in the Word, and God is speaking, and the Lord is whispering, and we've been in the Word, and He's cutting us to the heart, and He's moving in us, and we've been in the Word, and we've been in the Word, and now we're going to gather for a purpose. We're going to gather to hear from the Word, we're going to examine ourselves in light of the word and we're going to confess our sins before the Lord and maybe even one another as the Lord leads. And we're going to give thanks and we're going to adore Christ and we're going to pray for one another that we would walk in the way of the Lord and walk in his grace and know the goodness of his grace. I'm praying that more and more people would join us on Wednesdays for prayer that that would become a really regular rhythm as you gather in smaller groups, whether it's in a small group gathering or just over a meal, that we would 
discuss the word of the Lord and pray together that God would lead us and guide us as we seek to move forward as a faith family. Can I tell you something here at the end? There's a lot from Nehemiah that we can learn that's wonderful. It's an amazing story. But there is one really big difference between Nehemiah and us. Did you know that in chapter 10, the people initiated a covenant with God instead of the other way around? They actually talk about it like a contract. Did you know that through this whole journey that they went on, their goal was when they ordained that temple, when they walk in the temple, that the presence of the Lord would fall in the temple. Did you know that when that time came, God didn't show up? He didn't show up. Because the judgment, they were in exile for 70 years, but that was, that was permanent. For them, it was too late. It's too late. The big difference for us is Christ has come. For them, judgment was done. The end of the Old Testament people had arrived. The Spirit was not falling on the new temple. It was over. But 400 years later, hope was born. And all the Old Testament people could not accomplish, the power fell for us to accomplish. Christ came and showed us the way. He lived and loved and served, suffered, died, and rose again to secure victory for us. A few weeks later, the Holy Spirit fell. And Peter, who had been denying Christ the day before, was preaching Christ. Men laying their lives down for the cause. All but one of them died horrific deaths for the cause of Christ Jesus. How could they do that? They could do that because they'd heard the voice of God through Christ Jesus. The Spirit was at work helping them see and hear. And God unleashed a movement through them that is still ongoing today. Anybody in here ever been in a church that died? I have. Well, actually, it almost died. It was like right on the edge, and then Katrina happened. And um, a few years later, it really teetered all the way to the very edge, and then the Lord kind of brought it back. But I experienced all of the difficulty of it going almost all the way to the end. It's not a pretty picture. Did you know it's really slow? Most people don't even realize it's dying. They don't. And the big difference, the measuring stick, the big difference between the ones that God is using and the ones that God is allowing to fade into the pages of history is prayer. It's not even revelation and obedience. It's revelation and conversation. It's fellowship with the living God. I want to invite you into the sweetest fellowship. I want to invite you to take up the word of God and begin to walk in this word like it's the air that you breathe and the food that you eat. I want to invite you, church, as God speaks, to begin to respond in prayer. Not at, just as an individual, because that can be just as, that can be kind of scary. You don't always know what to pray, but begin to gather with the body of Christ and cry out to the Lord. And he will pour out his power in this place. And he will unfold his kingdom through this church. And they will tell stories of the goodness of God through Anchor Church.
for generations to come. Is that what we want? That's what I want. That's what the Lord wants. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for giving us this written word. Father, my confession today is that I don't always wake up every morning thinking, man, what does God have to say to me today? Father, I'm so sorry for that. There's a thousand things that I delight in that I set next to the word. God, help me to, to lay aside the weight. Focus on the other things, the created things, and, and help me, help us to take up your precious word. Father, I pray that prayer will become the reflex of our hearts and our lives as we hear from you day by day. Give us a vision of yourself and your word that is so great and so glorious and so good that the only response to your word is to enter in through the blood of Jesus Christ in relationship and conversation with the King by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, as you speak to us, give us the boldness to obey. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we close out our service, and we actually are, are going to close celebrating, which feels like a hard shift from, from where we've been, and uh, was reminded, as Matt, you were wrapping up there, and the reminder of the coming of Christ, who has done everything we could not and cannot and do not do. And uh, I, I wrote down before I came up here, we need the consolation of Christ. The Lord speaks his word. The Lord convicts us where we need that. But then the Lord also comforts us with the consolation of Christ when he says, though your sins are many, the mercy of God through Jesus is more. I want to bring us back to a passage we've heard in the past few months. This is from Ephesians 2. You'll know these words well. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, the, Lord, the Lord's bank account of mercy is overflowing. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, so before we were alive in Christ, the Lord loved us. He made us alive together with Christ by grace we have been saved. Amen? Amen? By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that not a single one of us can boast. None of us is going to be in the presence of Jesus and walk up to him and say, I made it. We're going to say to Jesus, you brought me here. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But as we think about the grace of the Lord, it's all the more reason that we should consider our lives and not take the grace and the mercy of Jesus lightly. And where we need to confess and repent, we do that, not presuming upon the riches of God's grace and mercy. The Lord is patient with us. He is long-suffering, not because he's turning a blind eye to our sin, but because he's patient and waiting for us to return in repentance. And so um, we want to end our service this morning with the consolation of Christ, but also in joy. Back in that Nehemiah passage, it says this. Uh, this is when Ezra and Nehemiah are, are dismissing the people, and they say, Now go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to the Lord, and then this consolation. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's joy in the house of the Lord because there's grace and mercy in the Lord. So we're going to end our service. I'm going to invite you to stand. And even though we're ending with joy and celebration, let's, as we leave this place, continue to let the Lord do his work in our lives. You can stand with us and let's sing this together.
week. Have a great week. Thank you again for allowing us into your home and your life today. We're glad that you've chosen to connect with us. And that message might have stirred something up in your heart. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. You know, today might be the most important day of your life. You might have chosen to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we'd love to know that. And we'd love to give you resources and connect with you and help you in your walk with him. Here's how you can let us know how we can pray for you. Send us an email at prayerline at anchorholds.org. We'll get that email, we'll follow up with you, we'll give you whatever you need so that you can uh, gain answers and so you can grow in your relationship with Christ. He thanks again for being with us online today, whether you join us again online or you join us in person, we look forward to seeing you again next week.